The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is asking a federal judge to throw out a lawsuit filed by a member of a high-profile Utah family. In new court documents, lawyers for the faith say Huntsman is seeking a refund because he's having a crisis of faith. Travis Wingood Cell, this is not, I repeat, this is not my Wednesday video intended for the prophets of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Just so that we're clear, YouTube will still retaliate. They're pissed that I had uh, <clears throat> reported on Nelson's death video, and they're refusing to take it down. But that will be a part of the intended Wednesday video. YouTube will not be equal. And that's uh, a problem with the topic for this video. It's religious insecurity. And or, uh, not really a religious addiction, but it's a part of the insecurity part of it. In the realm of psychos, the fake science field of bullying, they uh, diagnose people with insecurities by victim blaming them, calling their insecurities addictions. <clears throat> there are external chemicals that we can take into our body that will cause addiction. That's legitimate because it's a chemical alteration in your body. And your body craves that continual chemical alteration. So drugs, alcohol. But otherwise, the insecurities that I'm going to discuss in regards to faith insecurity, or in a faith crisis, is what we're going over. And so, yes, there's a certain psycho who's very prominent among ex-Mormons who've all had faith crises, who's taking advantage of them and victim-blaming them by saying that, well, he doesn't say it's an addiction. It's, he calls it a faith crisis. And it's a religious insecurity instead. And so, an insecurity has many different forms but it generally deals with our basic necessities. And then you've probably heard of the hierarchy of needs. Well, that's incomplete. I myself have uh, developed a fuller and accurate hierarchy of needs, but we're not gonna go over that. But it deals with our basic necessities for living. So your food, clothing, shelter. And when you are deprived of your basic necessities, you have an insecurity. It's not an addiction. <clears throat> and what happens is that when a person who's lived for a period of time in an insecure condition of at least one insecurity of basic need, and then all of a sudden they are given an opportunity to have what has been insecure, such as food, for example, uh, on my mission. I lost 50 pounds because the amount of money that we were required to have was insufficient for New York, New York. And as a result, we were not allowed to receive extra money above and beyond. But everyone else is doing it. But my parents were strict. I was not allowed to bring my pink paisley tie because it's not conservative. <laughs> and uh, uh, did it have to be, no, it didn't have to be dark can't remember, but uh, yeah, she took it away and gave it to my dad, and who threw it away. 
and so it was gone forever. That was their whole intention. I am not living right, and so therefore I must be forced to live right. You know, the whole takeaway agency is part of Heavenly Father's plan. <laughs> and uh, I also, because it was not on the list, did not have a towel when I entered the MTC. <laughs> uh, good old Elder Baxter had an extra because he and his parents did not follow strictly the list that we were supposed to bring. And so, dear God, I had to wait until, uh, was it Monday? Or was it not open on Mondays because of Monday? <laughs> and I had to wait until the when the store was open for me to go buy a towel. So that was great. And then also, you know, many complaints. <laughs> Won't go into them all here. Uh, <clears throat> and so yes, I starved. Literally starved. Went days without food after the incident. <laughs> Again, many stories to tell. My dad was furious. <laughs> it's not my fault. You guys set it up that way. <sighs> anyway. And so, uh, by the time I was in the Bronx, I uh, I was living off of Little Debbie Brownies, which were 25 cents each, and uh, that was it, literally. Uh, fortunately, uh, my mission companion, uh, Sean McFarland, knew Otar. And so we would go over to his place and he would cook us dinner. Excellent. But man, was he a klepto. <laughs> but otherwise, no, when we couldn't go over to his place every single night. It was only a, a few times that we did that for the... It would have been two months. Or was it just one month? Did I have two months left on my mission when I went to the Bronx, or one month? Or not, or three months. Anyway, I digress. So, <clears throat> there was one time previous where in a uh, district meeting, uh, we were uh, given a lunch. And it was uh, sandwiches with the sliced meats and, and fixings. And uh, I saw it and my eyes were bigger than what was actually there <laughs> because of my food insecurity. I was starving. And here I was presented with a buffet in my eyes. And, and so portioning with the amount of people that there were didn't occur to me under that condition because I was in a state of food insecurity and uh, and as I was chomping down on my uh, sandwich uh, I heard the, uh, the district leader yell out who took all the food <laughs> oh what a nightmare and then it was made worse when Creel Kofer decided to take out extra money from our monthlies so that he can pay for a bike fleet that I never got to use. Joy of joys. So yes, I lost 50 pounds as a young man. And if you didn't know, I was an athlete. I was trained by uh, Coach Lubin, whose daughter was forbidden the forbidden fruit. Don't even bother talking to her. Because you will never play basketball ever again. 
uh, he put several guys into the professional leagues. Uh, one of the Lakers came to our basketball practice, in fact. And so that's how uh, trained I was uh, with sports, for basketball specifically there. <coughs> and, uh, and so I'm fit. I'm perfect at the weight and size that I should be. And I'm losing 50 pounds on my mission. So it's not healthy. And so that gives you an idea of this insecurity I had. But it developed my honing techniques of finding coins while we were walking around the streets of New York. <laughs> uh, by the end of my mission, I realized that I had collected about $50. Uh, that's a sad story because he died in the 9-11 trade towers bombing. So, uh, that gives you an idea of the process of insecurities. You overindulge when you are presented, finally, with something. You're not able to portion it responsibly because you've been deprived for so long. And it's not an addiction. Don't listen to the psychos who are victim-blaming you. You have been victimized, being deprived of your basic rights. And uh, so I don't really need to go into that. We'll just go right into the religious part then. And so uh, <coughs> with religion, which is a basic need, a spirituality, an inner uh, religious concept uh, of, uh, of a divine, whether it's, uh, I learned, was it last night or this morning, uh, namaste, it is being uh, inappropriately used as uh, the uh, particular website that was correcting us Westerners. It's, it's only for greetings, and it's a hierarchy thing, where lower on the hierarchy say it to those of a higher har hierarchy. Uh, and so you don't say it to your besties, <laughs> as commercials are doing and all that stuff. Uh, it's a reserved speech. Our, uh, communication uh, and so in religion if your church and guess who is the focus of my channel deprives you of spirituality they are creating bullying you into a state of religious insecurity, which eventually you'll break and you'll go either of two ways. You'll submit to your bishop, oh, help me, I'm lost, or you'll say, forget it, I'm out, I'm having a faith crisis, I don't know where to turn for peace. And <clears throat> This comes from the church forbidding knowledge, forbidding the proper instruction to help people not be insecure. So for example, we have a coronavirus, and instead of providing spiritual security, the president of the church downplays it in the beginning, calls it a burden. Oh, uh, I have no choice but to close the church because the government leaders are forcing me to. Which was already delayed. And then 
that prompted our governor and local leaders to open up businesses prematurely, which helped spread and escalate the virus, causing a greater insecurity for our medical health and thus spiritual health. And and so Nelson then goes on to do coronavirus fasts, which was a false hope for Mormons, because they failed. No pacifying of insecurity whatsoever. And then Thanksgiving finally comes along, and he does the healing power of gratitude. The video that needs to be banned, along with the ones where he's doing the prosperity gospel with the fast to cure coronavirus. <clears throat> that YouTube is not doing what they did to me. They're not treating the church equally. See, with me, when I showed the clip of Dallin H. Oaks in General Conference's priesthood session back in 2018, where the ironic priesthood youth choir was there, at the end of the video, he does the Heil Hitler to the youth. And so I showed the clip. Now you know, Mormons. And that was pulled. YouTube just pulled it. Said, we've deleted your video. You can appeal. I appealed. They denied. Video gone forever. That's how quick it was. Same day. We're going on three days. Yeah, they're not going to treat the church equally with us peons. <clears throat> and so, uh, this is also a misinformation and disinformation, rather than a forbidding of knowledge. The forbidding of knowledge in the church comes from the era where they banned intellectuals. And they were primarily focused on September 6. Uh, those were six Mormons who were working for the Church History Department at BYU, uh, who were finding evidence, not hearsay, that uh, the church history is a lie. You have uh, D. Michael Quinn who tries to reconcile the new information that he's getting with the church. Because he even states, after he got excommunicated, that he would like to be Mormon still. Seriously, dude? Come on. I mean, he's dead now, so no deathbed repentance allowed. <coughs> but he did Mormonism, or, let's see, uh, Mormonism in the Magic World View because of the holiness to the Lord parchment, and the Jupiter stone, uh, the rocks in a hat. And so he was trying to harmonize church history with the new information. And he got it all wrong, if you've been paying attention to my videos. <clears throat> but nonetheless, the church tried to set an example with them to cause a fear and an insecurity in Mormons. And so no more is the church saying you need to study your scriptures. It's now read your scriptures. No more is it utilize the ancient languages to get a deeper understanding of the scriptures and draw closer to God and follow the principle that Joseph Smith has set forth in his church history, as well as what's recorded in the Book of Mormon. Nope, can't have that. Because that leads to Mormons finding out the truth, and the church doesn't want that. So they did an anti-intellectual thing. And so all things science, all things history research, were now forbidden in the church. And Unfortunately, with the internet, 11 million Mormons said, 
I'm having a faith crisis, I'm out. If you didn't hear the news yesterday from Fox 13 News Utah is where I heard it, <clears throat> the church replied, finally, in the James Huntsman a lawsuit down in California. If you're unfamiliar with the lawsuit that I filed with the church here in Utah, two of them actually, the lawyers for the church uh, replied with, I had no claim upon which relief can be granted. You can only get away with that in Utah when it's the church being sued. Because in California, the lawyers knew they couldn't get away with that. It means that when you are presenting that argument to a judge, you are saying, we all knew, you need to do what we say and dismiss this case. That's what it means. Nobody does it. It's taught, but nobody does it, because it means the judge is compromised and has to recuse themselves. <clears throat> and so you cannot sue the church in Utah. As Gaddy versus COP is experiencing that, Kate Birmingham is getting her butt kicked because the church pulled that on her too. So yes, even professional lawyers get that kind of treatment from the church. The church abuses everybody equally. but not in California. In California, they created the argument that James Huntsman is being a baby and is just going through an emotional faith crisis. He's saying, they're saying, that James Huntsman is religiously insecure and therefore is trying to uh, overcompensate by overindulging in the manner in which he wants his money back. His dissatisfied customer wants his money back. Uh, that should backfire on the church, actually. And if I were the judge, I'd say, well, why can't you just give him the money? I mean, you got trillions. Seriously, five million is nothing for you guys. But then everybody will do it. Well, maybe you should consider not causing religious insecurity. then you might keep your clients, your customers, your chattel. <laughs> but yes, 11 million since the advent of the internet and social media and the spreading of information. And so the church, uh, at first, was uh, going, oh, no, stay away from the internet. Everybody's putting up fake information on the internet. Well, of course they're saying that. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, this is uh, what's going on to help explain it to you. As Mormons uh, treat the church, attending church, which the article that I, uh, video I did from the article I did yesterday or the day before about the Bolivian man who thinks that church attendance cured him and it didn't actually cure him as it reveals in his article. He just feels cured. And he blames it on church attendance. I'm surprised because it's supposed to be temple attendance. It, if you're unfamiliar with uh, Karl Marx, he's misquoted and then misquoted as misquoted <laughs> by people who think they know. Uh, opium is a religion of the masses, and that's not a direct quote. Uh, I can bring it up for you. Google search it, assuming I don't get attacked in this process. Is 
the of the masses. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, they uh, say here uh, from the Marquette University Law School. Uh, they say the best translation is religion is the opium of the people. So I was close to that. Uh, but I see down here in Wikipedia they put masses. <laughs> so, again, I need to see the original uh, as a German to uh, figure it out. Uh, and and people s have assumed that he was trashing religion, that it's an addiction and needs to be avoided. And then others say, no, he was encouraging it because it's a great way to control the minds of the people for healthy reasons, spiritual reasons. No, he was indeed doing it saying that, yeah, it's a great thing so that you can be malevolent. <clears throat> Karl Marx is a very evil man. His Communist Manifesto makes that very clear. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's the concept of treating religion as an idol. That attending church blesses your life like the Bolivian man in the article. That's idol worship, where the structure of church, which is an object, is treated as if you can be blessed by attending or cursed by not attending. That's idol worship by definition. That's the universal religious doctrine. All religions practice it some more than others. Uh, for example, I saw a news feed <laughs> of <laughs> a statue of Jesus turns his head during Mass. <laughs> it's got the thumbnail picture of the, the pastor who's got his head turned towards the Jesus who's got his head turned. <laughs> and you've probably heard of others who said, It's bleeding! Oh, we don't know how this is happening. <laughs> or tears on the Mary. Oh, she's, uh, we're celebrating her ascension on Sunday. Yeah, the Catholics still celebrate ascension for Jesus and Mary. Nelson has taken away ascension from our doctrine again causing an insecurity among Mormons or should if Mormons were able to be knowledgeable in Mormonism but that's being denied <laughs> and so that's the simple form of idol worship is the belief that objects which are inanimate and yes AI blah blah no they're still objects the programmer is the, the artificial intelligence. If you program it a certain way, it's going to produce a certain outcome. So no, they're not real humans, despite the movies. <laughs> it's all based upon the programmer, the creator. Uh, the card was very intelligently written. <laughs> if you've seen it, Data has children. Two girls, twin girls. <laughs> anyway, I digress. And so, when attending church, or reading your scriptures, or praying, or attending the temple, etc., is conceived by the Mormons or anybody for that matter as being a blessing for participating in or a curse if you're not going 
that causes an insecurity where having church on Sunday you go to church it's spiritually uplifted because of the the uh, self-fulfilling prophecy of your idol worship that attending church will bless your life then you go home oh the spirit's gone <laughs> really? <laughs> really it's just gone huh so you never bothered to read the scriptures where the spirit is everywhere <laughs> all you have to do is tune into it and so yes, people feel a longing to get back to church. And you'll hear some fanatical Mormons say, Oh, I wish church were longer as Nelson took away an hour. And that we could have it during the week. I've heard people say that. Dear God. You know, it's the same thing with missions. Oh, I felt the spirit so strong on my mission, now it's gone. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm experiencing a faith crisis. Because I'm no longer on a mission. And so, some religious leaders have picked up on that and have realized, hey, let's get them involved in the ward mission program to help them transition back into society. God. <laughs> you don't lose the spirit unless you turn off the connection. It has nothing to do with watching an R-rated movie, swimming, seeing a woman. Hi, my name is Travis. <laughs> I have stories on that too. I was thinking about them while I was running. <laughs> and laughing with embarrassment. Dear God. If uh, uh, women would understand, if you've seen the movie uh, while you were sleeping, Sandra Bullock works in the toll booth, and uh, she's telling us about this fantasy guy that she sees, and uh, uh, he comes on Christmas Day, and he says hi to her for once, and she's unprepared, and because of her love insecurity, she responds with ah. and then he goes on his way and then she's humiliated and in her humiliation she goes I love you marry me <laughs> I think that will help you understand what I've gone through <laughs> in my life <laughs> and so It's this that has resulted in faith crisis, crises for Mormons. And again, I'll refer to Exmo Lex, as she recently did her video, uh, doing the thumbnail, showing all the various lattes and coffees. These were considered evil in the church. <coughs> yes, Exmo Lex is able to recognize though she's not able to communicate the wording of the specific field, as I've been going over with you, that yes, coffee has been turned into an idol, and that if a Mormon drinks it, they are now wicked, and evil, and fallen. Korahor! <laughs> it does no such thing! It's just a drink! If your body can't handle caffeine, you might have some problems. You'll have the headaches in the back of the head. But, no, it's not going to be damaging to you. Again, you have to look at the historical context upon which the word of wisdom was given. Emma had to do all the cleaning up after his meetings. She's pissed. The guys were messy. They're tobacco spitting. We're missing the spittle. It's the spittoon or whatever. And she has to clean up after them. And so Joseph, being the good husband, yes dear, 
I'll make a word of wisdom, not a commandment. Saying that, you know, guys, be nice to your wives. <laughs> and if you're unfamiliar with coffee back then, it's not our instant coffees. It's not the same. And that's where the confusion comes, as Mormons, having treated coffee as an idol, then try to identify the evil that is in coffee and have called it caffeine. And therefore, uh, they then say, well, anything with caffeine, therefore, is evil. And Mountain Dew all of a sudden becomes evil, rather than the dew of the gods. And and it's being sold in the underground market at BYU. <laughs> and I've even had women refuse to date me because they see me drinking Mountain Dew. <clears throat> and, and, and so that, that's frustrating, to say the least. But that's not what it's all about. The commandments are not commandments as idol-worshipping tools. And so, yes, coffee, the word of wisdom itself, becomes idol-worship. Oh no, I can't touch alcohol, I'll burn in hell. I don't touch alcohol, I don't like the burn. The, uh, and you're saying, you've drunk an alcohol? Yeah, the cough syrups. <laughs> They have alcohol. Yeah. Want nothing to do with them. And so as a teenager, I myself stopped doing the cough syrup. It's because, uh-uh, I'm not doing this. And so then you smell alcohol from the peers having their parties, and you go, oh, man, this, oh, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> I'm supposed to do this after I drink. I'm already wanting to do it now. And so, no, it's not an issue with me because of that. Then I find out in my DNA, it's a good thing because I'm a lightweight. I cannot handle alcohol, which could be part of the reason why the smell and the taste uh, is so harsh on my body. And... Uh, movie flashbacks here. <clears throat> and so when you have a church that perpetuates idol worship, as the church has done, you have Hinckley going on national TV news and interviews and saying, oh yeah, we, we don't touch. Isn't that great? We don't watch. Isn't that great? He's deceiving the world, not just Mormons. As Mormons are going, yeah, we're validated. We don't do things because we're idol worshippers. But it's this kind of thing that creates a faith crisis. And that insecurity, when a Mormon leaves the church, results in an overindulgence. Max Molex was overdosing on caffeine from coffee, big time. <laughs> or you'll have other Mormons, like my ex-mother-in-law, the first ex-mother-in-law, who, after divorcing her husband, obviously decided, I'm leaving the church too. So she goes to a bar. And I don't know how much she understood about bar culture. Is that when you go to a bar, you're there to hook up with somebody. You're not there to make friends and influence people. Nonetheless, she did the routine. Went to the bar. Man talked her up. She brought him home to her new apartment. And when he went for his move, she said, oh, no, no, what are you doing? Excuse me? And so his sex insecurity 
caused an overindulgence of rape. And that's a crime. I'm not condoning that whatsoever. But the ignorance that the church had taught my ex-mother-in-law resulted in that tragic condition when she went through a faith crisis and overindulged having left. And so the church technically is the one to blame because of the poor instruction that they're giving to the Mormons. The teaching and preaching of idol worship. Instead of teaching people to be secure with deity. By teaching Mormons how to have that connection and keep it it doesn't disappear. You don't lose a testimony. You lose faith. Because of your idol worship. And there is a scripture, I, I don't think I can find it, but I think it is before the one I talked about in the other video the other day. Uh, from Alma chapter 3 uh, do I dare uh, I don't think I should I'm already 42 minutes into this video it, it, I'm pretty sure it's before it uh, Mormon is talking ex-Mormons know what I mean <laughs> you've been through that faith crisis And I'm trying to correct your understanding. <clears throat> correct your knowledge. Uh, and it talks about how the people have suffered from the war that they've been through. And the loss of their property and possessions. They're now insecure. And he says they believed that it was the wrath of God, the curse of God that had caused that. No, it was your enemy that came in and attacked you. <laughs> and so his clarification there is crucial. They believed. You have the Mormon CES instructor who develops the uh, pride cycle. Throw it away, discard it from your mind. It's false information. There is no such thing as a pride cycle. It's the idol worshiping trap where you never pull out. And it's, I go to church, I'm prosperous. I go home from church, I've lost the spirit, I'm fallen. That's what he's referring to with the pride cycle. And it's a dangerous doctrine because it teaches Mormons, I'm prosperous, therefore I'm righteous. Oh no, I'm poor, it must be because of some wickedness I've done. But of course Mormons who are prosperous don't, see, they're not poor, so those who are poor are now perceived as having done something wicked. And thus the victim blaming, just as psychos do. Oh, it's an addiction. Uh, you're mentally ill because you're homeless. See how this all works? It's a dangerous trap. Don't fall for it. It's a false doctrine. That's not what the Book of Mormon is teaching. The Book of Mormon makes it very clear. You know, we can go to Alma 32 starting in verse 28. That's what the church should be emphasizing and teaching to all Mormons. And it's in the Bible too, by the way. In case you don't trust the Book of Mormon, for some reason. Again, your knowledge is incorrect. 
you need to be taught correctly about the authorship of the Book of Mormon and its intended instruction message. That, that's pretty much it. Uh, I didn't go to all of the information on my notes, but we're 45 minutes in. And I'm talking to myself, right? <laughs> <laughs>